everybody, welcome back. This is day number two of weekend number two of C++ number two. No, this is number one C++. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, for this first part of the lecture today is go over a little bit more about abstracted types, applied lists and strings, putting the pieces together with some of the concepts that we looked at yesterday. And then I'll wait um, until our first break, then we'll go over the midterm. So I posted the midterm last night. It's a take-home midterm. It's not in class today. Um, so it was not going to be due until August 22nd, so you have two months to work on it. Um, yesterday, I do know it's June instead of July. Yesterday, I kept thinking it was July. So July 22nd. No, it's June. Uh, so we'll, we'll do that the first break. Um, so here we have the uh, concepts that are covered in Chapter 12 or 13. Uh, just to give you some more examples, I mentioned, but you know, I didn't spend very much time mentioning a couple of items. I want enumerations, type defines, lists, arrays. Um, concept of that linked list. We're going to go over the assignment as well today uh, for the linked list and tell you what you need to do for that. It's actually fairly easy, actually. Um, but just to refresh your memory on this enumeration type, it is a data type, actually. It's a set of values together that you can perform operations on. So knowing what a data type is, it's actually, the data type itself has a definition, and usually built-in data types are the primitives used in abstract data types. Abstract data types are the user-defined or programmer-defined data types. So it's a combination of putting the pieces together to um, come up with um, things that are going to help you program, I should say. Um, and then as I mentioned before, this, this one here, I don't necessarily like to use the enumeration types. It's not supported in all languages. However, it does come in handy uh, to make things simpler. So in order to define a new simple data type called an enumeration, an enumeration is kind of like, um, well, to enumerate, to, it's just like the word, actually. Um, so we have uh, the three components that are part of a data type. It's the data type itself, the name, the set of values, and the set of allowable operations. Uh, so what you're going to get as an example on the final exam is going to be multiple choice, and uh, you're going to get a question like, <clears throat> what are the three components of a data type? or abstract data type. And the three components of an abstract data type are the name of the data type, <laughs> the set of values associated with the data type, and then the set of operations that are allowed for the particular data type. And then a question like, you know, well, what makes a enumeration a data type? Or what, what, what's an enumeration as an example? Well, it allows you to define um, names or enumerate actual values associated with numbers so that you can remember what the particular um, value is supposed to be. As an example, the syntax of it being enum with the name of the enumeration, like colors, and then value one, value two, value three, four, like red, white, blue, orange, you know, different things that have more meaning versus zero, one, two, three. Um, where they are called enumerators, these are enu the values are the enumerators, and they're being enumerated. Um, with the identifiers of the 0, 1, 2, 3. So it's a, enum is actually a reserved word in the language, and uh, it's a type is an ordered set of values. So you might uh, think that enumeration is an ordered set of values by definition. So here's enumeration colors, as I was mentioning before, with the brown, blue, red, green, yellow, which are all of the colors uh, that are part of the uh, colors enumerator, and defines a new data type called colors. So there is a such thing as a data type called colors in the language. It's an enumeration data type. Um, so the values belonging to this data type are brown, blue, green, yellow, you know, all the different things you might expect. Standing, or it could be status, a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior in a university setting, defines the enumeration type for standing. And then it follows all of the... Uh, the following are some illegal enumeration types. So one of the things I didn't mention yesterday when I was discussing enumeration types is that although these are together, so we have colors, and color says brown, blue, red, and green, as a, a yellow as an example, I couldn't come up with enumeration colors too, or um, other colors, or another colors, and repeat brown, blue, red, green, or yellow. You can only use them once. So... Uh, that's another thing you want to kind of keep in mind. So here's some other illegal enumeration types because none of the values is an identifier. So A, B, C, D, E, F, those are not identifiers, which means they're not proper names. You can't have a single character as a name. You also can't do first, second, third, fourth 
as an identifier because you can't start out a legal you can't start out a legal variable name with a number. It has to start out with a character. I can't start out with a special character. So it has to follow all of the rules that are associated with variables. And you can't repeat. So the following are also illegal, are legal data types here because these are not characters. So these are numbers. So if I gave you a multiple choice question and I gave you this line here and I said, eh, true or false, is that a legal enumeration type? And then you know, if, or if I tell you this is an illegal enumeration type, why? Because you put values instead of identifiers in. So the identifier is the actual name. You can have a very, I, I misquoted a few minutes ago here, you can have a variable that has a single character. You can call it, you know, integer i works all the time. You know, character a, b, c. But you can't put the value in. The problem is these are values. This is the name. So these are identifier names. So it's A, B, C, D. So these are not values. And then it, this would have to be first, second, third, fourth, because it can't start out with a number, because names can't start out with numbers. <clears throat> so if a value already is being used in one enumeration type, it cannot be used in another enumeration type either in the same block. Same block is the key. It's like reusing variable names. If I have integer i in a function, I can't go integer i again. I'm going to get a compiler um, error. Uh, so same rules apply to enumeration types as declared outside of any blocks. So outside of blocks are different. So here we have, uh, this one's illegal because we have John and John in here. And so we have two of the same names. So you can't be a math student and a computer science student simultaneously. Well, you can't have the name John and do that as well. So. So I suppose these statements are in the same program in the same block. The second enumeration type, computer science, here is not allowed because of the repeated value. So you might see something like this, and it might be, you know, why is this illegal? You know, you know we're probably not going to highlight the word John in the example, but say, well, because you can't mix and match values or something. So that's kind of the nature of the final exam. You don't actually have to write source code. Instead, you'll have questions that are B theory based. Like, you know, questions on enumerations, questions on structures, questions on classes, and stuff like that. You know, as a, as a kind of, um, not trivia, but like syntax, but not having to know the syntax, knowing something about the data type itself is uh, more important. So here's the syntax for declaring a variable the same as, as before. So we have data type identifier, identifier. <coughs> so... The following statement defines an enumeration type for sports, and so we have enumeration sports, basketball, football, hockey, so the following declares variables, so sports, popular sports, I'm on my sports. So you declare variables of the enumeration type the same way as uh, you declare variables of other data types. So to declare, a data, to declare a variable, it's all done the same way, regardless of the data type. Uh, so you use enumerations the same way as you use classes, same way as you use structures. So here's another statement here for an assignment expression. And on an enumeration, the assignment expression isn't 0, 1, 2, 3. It's what's inside of the enumeration. So it has to be in one of these values. So if I said I have a piece of data called popular sports and it's of the sports data type, then the values that can be associated with it are basketball, football, hockey, volleyball, soccer. And those are the sports. So here I have popular sports is equal to football. Uh, stores, uh, football here for popular sports. Another statement here, my sports is equal to popular sports. Well, if there's the same data type, you can assign one data type to the other data type. And then you get a match on the data types. So it copies the contents of popular sports into my sports. So operations on enumeration types. No arithmetic operations are allowed <coughs> on enumeration types. So you can't take one and add two to it which is kind of odd because you'd think you'd be able to but if I added if popular sports I don't know what popular sports was equal to it was equal to looks like uh, football football plus two isn't going to give you one to baseball it's not going to work because they're not actual they're enumerated so they're not actual integer values so this one here is not going to work also you can't say football plus soccer how are you going to get something out of that football plus soccer is it going to be equal to popular sports well, a lot of people try to do it because they think, you know, isn't that zero and one and two and three? Well, that's like the purpose of the enumeration, so you don't have to know zero and one. Not, you forget about the integers, even though they are integer-based kind of sequences, just like an array, very similar to an array. 
you can't treat it like an array and you can't do any arithmetic on it. Also, incrementing and decrementing operations are not allowed either. You can't go sports plus plus. That doesn't work. <laughs> um, so to increment a value in a popular sports by one, you can cast the operator as shown here. <clears throat> so static cast sports, popular sports plus one. That actually works because you're casting. So it's a static cast on sports, which means treat it like a sport from the sport enumeration. Take popular sport, which was equal to football, add one to it, which is going to be the next one in line, which I think it's going to be, yeah. And we had it equal to football, so now it's equal to hockey, because this is the next one over, if you treat it like an enumeration. This is actually called a static cast. You actually, this is the words you would actually put in. Okay, let me pause the video. Okay, sorry for that interruption. Uh, so this is what's really referred to as a static cast, and you actually put that in there. And what it is, it's uh, casting this enumeration to a sports type, and this is the type that you're casting it to. We see this with the standard template libraries as well. In the standard templates, we specify the type, and when we specify the type, we make an enumeration of that particular type. So after the second statement, the value here for popular sports will be hockey because uh, it went from football plus one to hockey plus another one. So the following statement here results in storing basketball in popular sports. So we have football, and then we go popular sports minus one, and it goes basketball, football, hockey. So we're going to minus one, so we go backwards one. Without the static cast, there's no way of actually doing an arithmetic expression. So it's illegal to do this above here because we're not casting it. We can't just say popular sports. Well, popular sports isn't an integer. When we do the cast, we cast it into the enumeration type, and then it's okay. We can do it that way. So, which is kind of um, kind of interesting. It's kind of a hokey way of doing it, but uh, some people might consider it hokey, some people not. So in terms of the relational operators, suppose we have an enumeration type sports, and uh, the uh, variables popular sports and my sports are defined above. Uh, in terms of the ones we just looked at. Then we can say, is football less than or equal to soccer? Is hockey bigger than basketball? And that, I don't think that makes any sense. I mean, how could there be one that's less than another one? Um, actually, it works. Uh, so you could say, you know, if you had a color scale of a hue, for example, <clears throat> we had different shades of blue, and you had a darker side and a lighter side, you could test to see which side it was on, perhaps might make more sense. Also, um, in terms of uh, the comparison, you could say popular sports equals soccer, my sports is equal to volleyball, then popular sports is less than my sports might come out and say it's true as well. So the enumeration types and the loops, we can also use one in a loop. So suppose my sports is a variable, it's declared above, that we've seen in the previous example. We could say for my sports is equal to basketball, my sports is less than or equal to soccer, my sports is equal to, and then we can say a static cast here for sports, sports plus one. So it's kind of like saying uh, for um, i is equal to zero, i is less than some number, i plus plus, which is the same thing as we're doing, and that would leap through in this particular case five times because it's going through each one of the sports that's in the enumeration. We can also put input and output and combine it with enumeration types. So input and output are defined only for built-in data types such as uh, integer, character, and double. So enumeration types can neither be input nor output directly. So you can input and output enumerations indirectly. So that means using it with C in, C out, stuff like that. Uh, so here's an example. So we have enumeration courses, and in the courses we have algebra, uh, basic, uh, well, these are programming languages, Pascal, C++, philosophy. And then we have courses registered. And then we can have um, <coughs> CN, character 1 and character 2. And then we can switch characters. So if you did A for algebra, B for basic, P for Pascal, or something, you could you know do something like this, where you do a case switch. But no is another piece of information that you cannot use in enumeration for direct I.O. You can't see it in, you can't see it out. But this is the indirect way of doing it. So you'd have to select one of them and then go through this and go, well, if it's A, then we have algebra. Otherwise, if you typed in algebra, 
it's going to be an illegal character. So, and here's your character. So we have character, character one, character two. We read those characters and we do a case switch on it. We figure out, well, which one is it that they want? We assign the correct enumeration for it. So they cannot be output indirectly. Excuse me, they can be outputted indirectly, but not directly as well. So we can switch register and then we can print out. If it's algebra, see out algebra. But we're seeing it out as a string and we're using the quotes for the string. So we can't see in and we can't see out. Oh, now everybody's showing up. Too late, you already missed attendance though. Well, you'll get it in the afternoon. Um, so you can miss a total of four though, it'll be okay. Uh, so let's see. You are independently, or excuse me, indirectly printing it out using a string. So you're not printing out algebra. You're printing out algebra with a string. So it's a different, actually. So if you try to output the value of enumeration directly, the computer will output the value assigned to the enumeration. So you'll get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, which is actually kind of interesting. So suppose that uh, registered uh, equals algebra. The following statement outputs the value 0 because uh, the default value for assigned to algebra is zero. It's the first item in the enumeration. So then we have zero that gets printed out. Um, or here we have uh, uh, this one here, philosophy is number four, so it prints out philosophy. Excuse me, it prints out four if we say see out philosophy. So Functions and enumeration types. So enumeration types can be passed as parameters to functions as well, either by value or by reference, if you remember that from yesterday. And the functions can return a value of the enumeration type. So here we have courses, read courses. And uh, courses registered with character one and character two. Enter the first two letters of the course. And then we see in character one and character two. And then we can switch the characters. And if we switch the characters, then we can indirectly assign one of the uh, ones to the other ones. So. And this is inside of the function, by the way. <coughs> and then we can print. So what do we do? We use courses as the data type of the enumeration. And the instance of that data type is called registered. So this is legal. And we can switch the registered. So it could be... You know, if it's algebra, if it's analysis, basic, it'll print out one or the other. So here we're not taking um, a parameter in, but we're reading the courses, and then here we're passing the parameter here to the function call. So printing enumeration. So you can use a parameter. Excuse me. You can use an enumeration as an argument in a function call to uh, actually print out the values. So declaring variables and defining the enumeration type itself, as mentioned before, grades A, B, C, D, this is course grades. So this is all in one shot. So sometimes you see it like this. If you're going to do an enumeration, probably not going to hang around for the life of the, it will hang around for the life of the program, but you're doing it for some reason. So here you have a declaration and a definition all in once. So you have enumeration grades, and then you have space, course grades. You can do the same thing with structures, actually, as well, with classes. You can do it's it's basically follows the definition of the data type. Then you make the instance of the data type, or you make the, the one that you're going to have along with it. Here's another one. We have coins, or we have uh, change and U.S. coins are the two data variables that are defined as coins. And coins are pennies, nickels, dimes, half dollars, and dollars. And these are the course grades. And it's the enumeration variable that we're going to be using is called course grades. And these are two of them here, change and U.S. coins. You can also have an anonymous data type. So why give it a name? See, these guys have names, coins and grades. So a data type in which the values are directly specified for the variable declaration with no data type name. So it's anonymous. Here we have enumeration. What do we have? Basketball, football, baseball, and hockey. And then we're calling it my sports. But there's no enumeration. Because if you're not going to reuse it, you're just going to have my sports. And you're going to have my sports as basketball, football, basket, baseball, and hockey. Why call it sports <laughs> or something? It's just, you know, so we created the variable with it. So, and this is called an anonymous. Uh, the drawbacks of the anonymous, you can't pass an anonymous type as a parameter to a function because there's no data type. There's no name for the data type. How is it going to be passed as an argument to a function? Also, a function cannot return a value of an anonymous data type. How are you going to return the enumeration when there's no data type to make the function? 
so you don't have a name data type. So the values used in one anonymous type can be used in another anonymous type. So you can reuse the values in this case. But the variables of those types are treated differently because they're two different variables. So if you wanted to reuse hockey baseball, that's one of the ways. Just don't name it. Then you have another enumeration that can contain the same values. So <clears throat> here's one. We have an enumeration here for languages, and then we have foreign languages, which are the names of the enumerations that we're going to use for the variables. And this is repeated completely, but it's two of the same. But if I said languages equals foreign languages, that's illegal. You can't see it's kind of cut off, but it's on the bottom here. If I said languages equals foreign languages, nope, can't. They're not the same data type because there's no data type. They're anonymous. We can't tell. So whenever you want to use it as a data type, you can't use it as a data type. If you, if you make it an anonymous type. So another question on the final exam might be something around the nature of, can you have a, an anonymous data type? Certainly, why not? Here's one, you're looking at one right here. <laughs> it's an enumeration. The data type doesn't have a name to it. So if all data types needed a name, would that necessarily be a correct statement? No. You can have an anonymous data type. You don't have to put a name on that. Uh, but anyway, the questions aren't going to be tricky like that. That would be a trick question, actually. You're not going to find tricky questions. You're going to find questions that are very straightforward. You know, as an example, you know, the classic one, can you reuse a, a value stored in one enumeration inside of another enumeration in the same block? No, can't do that. So. Uh, you can create an instance of the data type along with the definition of the data type. You can do that with most data types in the language as well. So. Type define. So this is another one here in C++. You can create synonyms. I call them renames, but it's really a synonym or an alias to a previously defined data type using the type defined statement. So the general syntax is the type defined is type defined with an existing type name along with the new type name that we're going to give it. So in C++, type defined is a re reserved word. You can't reuse it. And its statement does not create any new data type. It creates only an alias for an existing data type. So it's like type define int here. Here's a good example. This is the example I use over and over again. The following statement creates an alias to an integer for the data type int. So if you don't like int and you like int, uh, I-N-T-E-G-R, integer, I always misspell that. I always put an I in there. Uh, the following statement creates, I can misspell it actually and use it in my language if I want to by using a type define. So type define int to integer. Now I can use integer, integer i instead of int i. Uh, so the following statement creates an alias for a double. You can do this with any data type you want. Double real, so now I can go real. So the following statement creates an alias for a decimal of the data type double, double decimal. So then I get this stuff here. And I can go, well, constant boolean, boolean. What's a boolean? Well, that's an integer of the type defined. So then the confusion comes into place. People go, Boolean flag? Boolean. When we have Boolean in the language? Because way, way, way at the top of the code, someone put a type defined in there. It said integer to Boolean. So now Boolean is like a 0 or a 1 because the language never supported it or something. And now we have, now we have Boolean in there. And I'll say, OK, good. So Boolean true. Actually, you can do it an enumeration for a Boolean and have true and false, <laughs> which is 0 or 1. You can actually create your own Boolean data type out of that, actually, if you use an enumeration. And then uh, you don't even have to use a type to find with an enumeration. Just create an enumeration for it. And you can say Boolean flag. Flag is equal to true. Flag is equal to false. There's your Boolean. So the statement in line number one creates the alias here, type define integer Boolean for the data type int. Statement number two and three declare names of uh, constants as true and false. Boolean true. Constant Boolean true is equal to 1, false is equal to 0. Uh, and then statement number 4 declares flag to be a variable type of Boolean, Boolean flag. And because flag is a variable type of Boolean, the following statement is legal. Flag is equal to true. So uh, we have Boolean in the language. <laughs> so, so the string data type. So this is really everything you wanted to know about enumerations but never wanted to try. So, or type defines. There's a lot of people that overuse type defines and enumerations, and there's people that don't use them at all. I'm one of the people that don't use them at all because then I look at the code later on and I go, what is this Boolean? What is this my special integer thing going on here? You know, I have to remember, oh, that's an enumeration. 
Oh, just more to remember later on. If I just call it int, then I know it's an integer. But it may not necessarily be straightforward in terms of trying to remember what color is that? Is it 0, 1, or 2? I don't know. I have to remember what color I associated with it. What's 0? So, actually, you know what I do? I just got you pick common numbers like red, white, green, red, white, blue, red, you know, RGB colors, you know, all the scale. And then you use the standard ordering. <laughs> and then you know what 0, 1, 2 is. You know. Anyway, I say red, white, and blue because this, we're coming up to 4th of July coming up, so it's red, white, and blue. United States uh, independence. Yeah, I know you guys don't celebrate it, but actually, you should. You're in the U.S. Celebrate so Fourth of July. Here's how you celebrate: you just go to a barbecue, just like Memorial Day. It's barbecue. <laughs> it's all about food in this country. <laughs> String type. Uh, food and uh, water sports. So Fourth of July is different from. This is trivia here. Fourth of July is different from Memorial Day weekend. Memorial Day weekend is all about the food, the barbecue, the backyard parties. Fourth of July, it's about the ocean. It's about the rivers, the lakes, the water. You have to have water, food, and alcohol. <laughs> That's Fourth of July. String tape. You'd be like, what did I learn in C++ today? Water, food, and alcohol. <laughs> That's what makes Fourth of July more popular. Um, and then Labor Day. At the end, is it Labor Day? Is at the end? Memorial Day, Fourth of July. The Labor Day is at the end in September or something. And that's your last minute barbecue. Uh, if the weather's good, no water, not any alcohol either. It's just barbecue. <laughs> it's not quite as good. <clears throat> but then you can't wear white after Labor Day. So it's the last day to wear white, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I, there's some weird things going on in this country. <laughs> All right, go, let's go back to string. Okay, so these are string data type. The program must include a header. Obviously, we've got that part. Now, I'm going to review the concept a little bit. Then we'll get into string methods, which makes it more popular. And we all know how to assign a name to a string. There's William Jacob and declares a string variable. So the position of the first character, w, in the name is 0. And then the position of the second character, i, is 1. So this actually is a character, right? We found out that yesterday in terms of looking at the array stuff. And then the variable name is capable of storing just about any size string uh, to a certain point. So then we have the binary operator plus. So it can allow us to concatenate. Uh, and so it takes an array of an index of subscripts. And you can define the data type string itself of that. So we use the following declaration. We do string 1, string 2, string 3. So the statement uh, string 1 is equal to hello there. It stores a hello there. String one, string two is equal to string one copies string one into string two. So here's the here's the trick. Um, now that you know about type defines, you know about enumerations. Isn't this another array kind of sort of thing? But it's not. It's actually an object. So it's a new data type, but it's constructed of existing data types. And the existing data type that it's constructed of is a character array. So they took a character array, they made it into a string by you know, manipulating around into a, an object data type. You can make your own string if you want. And then they added a bunch of methods to that string to make it more useful. So we can do all sorts of different operations. So you can define different operations. An example, the plus is concatenation. So if string 1 is equal to sunny, then string 2 is equal to string 1 plus day, then we have sunny day. So if string 1 is hello and string 2 is there, then we have hello there as string number 3 if we added them together. And we put a little space in between the two words. And a statement is equivalent to this statement, where string 3 is equal to string 1 plus a space and then string 2. So string 1 is, uh, you know, hello there, Mickey, if we add it all together. Or update this string value by appending the string to the old value. So here's a different part here. So if string 1 is hello there, then the statement string 6 is t. Well, where's the t coming from? Uh, replaces the care. Oh, we're replacing it. I'm sorry. We're replacing the lowercase t with the uppercase t. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is the sixth character. So what you're going to see on the midterm exam is uh, what if you did this, excuse me, final exam, is you, it give you the hello world, hello there, or hello statement, and then you're going to have this one here, 
it's going to be equal to t, what's the finished sentence? And then you have to know, well, this starts with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and it's hello there with a capital T. Or it might be, um, you know, this is also a two-dimensional array as well, right? So you have the two, two, two rows and columns with this. So you can actually go 6, 0, 6, 1, 6, 2. You can get one, the first word or the second word. So that's what I went over yesterday, actually. With, we saw this yesterday, by the way, <laughs> with two-dimensional arrays as well. Uh, so the data type string has a data type. So the string itself has a size type. So it's the name of a constant for n position. So we have string with a size type, so it's an unsigned integer, integer data type. So the number n position is the maximum value of the data type. So it's the number that is, here's the number here, uh, it's a pretty big number. So unless you're storing an entire book or half of a book for the string, you're not going to fill it up. Or, you know, half of a page of information. So we have a built-in function called, a function, it's actually a method called length. And so the length function returns the number of characters currently in the string. So the value return is an unsigned integer. And the syntax is called using this method here. So string variable dot length. So in some languages it's L-E-N-T-H. Sometimes it's L-E-N. This is length actually spelt out. Uh, where string variable is the name of the variable that's of type string. And the function length has no arguments. So. So consider the following statements, and the following statements are string first name, string name, string, string. First name is equal to Elizabeth. Name is equal to first name plus Jones. We have Elizabeth Jones now. And then the second string here is it is Sunny. So we can do some manipulation here to figure out what the length of these guys are. So first name dot length outputs 9. Name dot length outputs 15. String dot length outputs 12. We just count up the characters. The characters, although the character positions start with zero, there are still only nine characters. This is a common mistake people will do. They go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, there's nine characters in here. There's not eight characters. So make sure you read the questions so you know how many characters are in that array. It's amazing how I can, uh, you know, ask a very simple question. What is First name dot length going to output, and people put eight. Is that, what's that eight? It starts with zero. Oh, I remember it started with zero. What's the fifth character? Well, you have to start with zero. <laughs> it's really the sixth character. So the function length returns an unsigned integer, which is what we've got up here. So the value return can be stored in an integer variable. So since the data type is a string and it has a data type here, string, and then there's a scope resolution operator to say that this method is inside of this object string. It's associated with it. So the variable can hold the length, the return of the length, so we can do this. Here we can go size type len, and then we can look at len and say, well, what's the value of that going to be? Well, len is going to equal to the first name dot length, so it's going to be 9, 15, and 12. So it returns an integer. It can be assigned to an integer value. So we can come up with length and then use length as we know how big it is. Why do we want that? Because we're going to send the string to a function. And what if we want to send the length of the string? So we have to send the first name to the function or the last name to the function. We can start at this position, go to that position, figure out how long it is, and we know how long it is, and send it rather than having to figure it out later. There's also a size function. So the size function is the same as the length function. Both of these functions return the same value, but the syntax to call the function is dot size instead of dot length. So where the string variable is a variable of the string type, as in this case the function length and the function size has no arguments associated with it. We just give it the size or give it the length. So. Why, do there's, why are there two methods with the same name? Because people like size, people like length. It does the same thing. There's no difference between a length and a size, but it exists. So. We also have the find function. This one comes in handy, but hardly ever people, they go out of their way to treat it like a character array instead of using the methods that are associated with the object. So we have find in here. 
So find function searches a string to find the first occurrence of the pop, uh, popular substring and then returns the unsigned integer. So here we have a uh, string here, find this expression. It could be a sub-expression or like a space. We find the space, then we have the first name, space, last name. Then we know which how to break the string out. So a string is a string variable that's an expression, which is a string itself, which is a substring. So it evaluates through the string and the string expression. It can also be a character. It doesn't necessarily have to be a string. It could be a character, like a space or something. So if the search is unsuccessful, the find returns the position that it left off with, where the match, excuse me, if it is successful, it returns the position where the match actually returns an integer value. So find a, I found it at 6 or found it at 5. For the search to be successful, the match must be exact, same case, uppercase, lowercase. So if the string is unsuccessful, it returns uh, the number not a n position, which is not a position within the string. N stands for not, no position. So the following are valid calls. We have find the dot find the substring the a this one plus this one. You can put anything you want as a parameter. As long as it evaluates to a character or to a string, then it can be searched to be found inside of the other string. String sentence, string str, and then uh, we're going to find the position from the size type. So the sentence is it's cloudy and warm, string cloudy. So here's some effects that might show up with some manipulations with find. Find is, it outputs 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, the starting position of the substring. And it's going to be at 13, S is at 4. So you could possibly find that it's nice for searching through. Actually, you can do a word count. Find all the A, you know, find the first A, then go back, find the second A, find the third A, find the position by moving it forward. So, which is kind of like how a word count actually sort of works. If you're going to count the number of characters, count the number of words within a sentence or something. And then now we have the substring, substring function. That yeah, returns a particular substring instead of position. So find finds the position where the substring is located. Substring actually returns the substring. So the syntax to call the substring is expression 1, comma, expression 2 from the substring, where expression 1 and 2 are the expressions evaluated by the unsigned integers. So here's some examples. Expression number 1, it's going to specify the position like 0 to 5. And it's going to give you, well, if you know, if, zero, if you find the position of the space, yes? Okay, now that those distractions are over with, let's continue. Uh, we, we are going to have an official break soon, don't worry about it. For those people who were here at 9, we're ready for the first break coming up. Alright, so the expression here, <coughs> with the first two expressions, we have, uh, what are we doing here? Ah, the substring. So we've got uh, a sentence that is a combination here of, a, it is cloudy and warm. And so in our sentence, we have substring 0, comma 5. So this is 1, excuse me, this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, stops on the fifth. So from 0 to 5, because there's a space after is, so let me come up here, it's actually a little easier to look at it from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. <laughs> That's why we get, and then cloudy is 6 to 6, 6 one, which is zero. One, two, three, four, five, six. So don't get confused with the zeros. The counting numbers actually start with one. The array starts with zero, or the string starts with zero. So six to six is cloudy, because it's at the sixth space, sixth position. So think of it not like the number six, but it's the sixth position, and then you go by six spaces. So the counting starts with one, so a little inconsistent in terms of the way that arrays work, but it is more intuitive for counting. So we know that if a, a first name is 15 characters, it starts with zero, go, well, zero to 15, or 14, whatever, and then you can figure it out from there. So. It allows you to get subscreens. 
substrings out of a string string. So we also have swap, where we can take one part and swap it with another. It's kind of like find and replace, if you think about it. We find something, and then we replace it, well, we swap. So find and swap. So here we have a swap method. It's used to swap the contents of two string variables. So here we have a string variable one dot swap with string variable two, where string variable one and string variable two are string variables. And suppose you have the following statement, string one is warm, string two is cold. After the following executes, the value of string one is cold and the value of string two is warm because it got swapped. So string one dot swap with string two. And now we have the function uh, isVal. Well, we can actually have a figure out. There's a lot of stuff we can include in with the string library, actually. So the isVal, is it a vowel? A E I O U. <laughs> so, uh, Boolean isVal. I'll switch it here. What do we got here? Uh, A E I O U, capital and lowercase. Is it capital and lower? I don't know. Returns true, returns false. So, the isVal. We have two upper. Upper, lower, to lower, to make it lowercase, uppercase, um, things of like that. Rotate, let's rotate. Function takes a string as a parameter, removes the first character of the string, and places it at the end of the string. It rotates it. So it's done by extracting the substring at position one until the end of the substring, and then adds it to the first string. So rotate string, rotate string, and it's going to take a string, and then uh, returns the string. So it takes the length, and then um, it takes the substring 1, length minus 1, position, and then rotates it around. So it takes it, puts it at the end. So it might be used for a queue, actually. Take the first guy, put it at the end. Second guy, put it at the end. Third guy, put it at the end. Rotate the entire string. Reverse the string. You can actually reverse it an entire string using the rotate. Things about strings are made up of individual characters denoted by double quotes. Have invisible characters at the end. They're called the null character, as we saw before. Null terminal character, by the way. How many characters in the word cat? <laughs> Final exam question. How many characters are in the word cat? Well, written this way. Here's the key right here. There's four characters. There's four characters in that statement. There's a null character at the end. So you have to take it plus one. If this were single quotes, there's three. Well, actually, it would be illegal. If it were single quote C, single quote A, single quote T, there's three characters. There's four characters <coughs> in the string called cat. Okay. So a string is an array of characters which contains a non-printing null character with ASCII value zero making it, marking the end. So if we have this here, the string can be initialized in its declaration in two different equivalent formats as we've seen before. This is how the string actually equates to the character array. Message 8 is hello with the null character at the end. Message 8 hello. So it can take any, any number of num characters up to the maximum that's allowed for the string. So here's our message hello, and then eight word wrapped, excuse me, the, this null character word wrapped, it's actually right here in the fifth character, fifth, fifth spot of the array. So character versus the string, A has a data type character and is stored in one bit. A with the quotation marks next to it is a string and has two bits because we have that null character. So even though this is a character, if we store it like a character, it only takes up one space. If we store it like a string, we get the two because we have that null. So never forget there's a null character at the end. So, well, let's just say never forget, but if you forget, you'll remember when you start printing things out. Yeah, it's off by a space, and there's a problem with it. Or you try to see in a string and it doesn't work correctly. So, so recall that we have this character message eight. So to the compiler, the value of the identifier message alone is the base address of the array. So we say that the message is pointer because the value is an address. So it points to a memory location. And the name of the address message, the name of the string, is the name of the memory address where we're starting with. 
So we know how many characters there are by what we assign to it, and we know the end of it with the null character, which is why we always search the string till null. Till null. And then we can pass the string as a starting address. So declaring strings here, you can do it multiple different ways. With the character array, 255 characters, setting the size of the array to 255. Or with the pointer. So character pointer, character array, which is the same thing, they're equivalent. So we don't have to say 255. That's a waste of space, actually. It's going to allocate all that space with the uh, with this with this particular you know uh, reference. There sets the character array pointing to a space that's only 15 big, more efficient. So the people who are worried about efficiency use a pointer to define that. If I gave you that on a final exam and I said, "Is that an array?" It certainly is. <laughs> doesn't look like an array, but it is an array. It's a character array. It's equivalent to this. Well, except for this in here, instead of 255, we got 15, because it's assigned with the string. So as we know from yesterday's array lecture, we can leave this blank. Actually, we can put a blank opening and closing bracket at the end of that as well. It would be equivalent. And it would be set dynamically to 15, whatever we assign to it. And it changes. So these are variable excuse me, dynamic arrays versus static array. So the character array is actually dynamic. If we had this character array here and we wanted to change it so it said blah, 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 and it added two more blahs to it, it'd take it just fine. If we used it as an array and we, we did the blah, 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 and we add two more, we're going to write past the bounds of that array, which is kind of odd. This is why people like this. So when you see the asterisk here and you see it's a pointer, always think dynamic. Things can change. When you don't see any pointer characters, think static. Things can't change. <laughs> so people prefer this because it is dynamic. So you can change. Both ways accomplish the same thing because both are pointers to memory. This is a pointer to memory, but you're setting the size versus this one that's not setting a size. So reading a string from the user, you can use a CN to get the word. So character array 255, C in character array. You can also use a cn.getLine to get the entire line of text instead of just the word, you get the entire line of 255. We saw this at W yesterday. There's a danger when getting input, however, is how many characters are you going to get in. The user can type in a string longer than the array that you've set up, actually. Uh, so it results in a crash. It normally does. So try going to someone else's, because uh, it goes into somebody else's memory. So you can set the set W to solve the problem on the input. So you see in set the width to 255, which means don't read any more than 255 characters in, because if you read more than that, you're going to be in trouble. So it ensures the input does not exceed the size of the array. You know you can do this with the output as well. So you can see out the set width. You can create columns. So it doesn't go further than a certain point. It stops it short. Different than tabs. Tabs are going to put a tab at the end of the string, but what if one string is longer than the other? It's not going to set the column correctly. In terms of printing the strings, simple. Use a C out to do this. So C out the character array. It doesn't matter. It's the same as a character array. You get the starting address. Prints it out. So we have some string functions. The whole library is uh, dedicated to strings here. I'm not going to go through all of these, but it gives you a few more examples of functions, that, methods that you can call. String copy, concatenate, compare tokenize, all sorts of different ways of returning characters, integers, and all sorts of different goodies that are associated with that. So the compare compares to strings, because you can't do this. You can't go string one is equal to string two. Is string one equal to string two? Like Never are they ever going to be equal. <laughs> are the memory addresses equal? Never. These are memory addresses, by the way. The name of the string is a memory address. It's a pointer. It's a character. We just saw it up here. It's a character. <laughs> character pointer or character. Is a memory address ever going to be equal? Never. So if I put this on a midterm exam and say, is this a valid statement? No. <laughs> if it's a string, it's not going to be equal. So string one is never going to be equal to string two, regardless of, even if they're identical, like the same case and everything, they're never going to, two memory addresses are never going to be the same on a computer. Um, so an example here would be to use a string compare. This is where most people end up figuring out, oh, there's a method for that. 
because you try to go, well, okay, if uh, the user typed in algebra, is algebra equal algebra? Not going to equal algebra. <laughs> if you do the string, it's never going to equal. Because is this, a, is this memory address 0x5544ff9 equal 0x, it's a two hex decimal addresses you're comparing. Uh, so you use the string compare. So the results are going to be less than zero. You don't need to know this, but you know, less than zero if it's going to be hello is smaller than world in terms of its um, positioning, alphabetical order, ascending A uh, to B, A, A to Z. If uh, the result is going to be equal to zero if they're the same characters inside of it, and then it's going to be larger than if it's a uh, one is bigger than the other, but it's not. It's, Uh, string tokenizing tokenizing so you can have a token sequence of characters separated by some delimiter um, so you can export a bunch of data out let's say from a database table and it's a ASCII character dump of lines of code or something or lines of data it's all comma delimited or space delimited which means there's a space between each one of the words or piece one of the datas or there's a comma so what are tokens anything's a token it's a word. Delimiter is what's separating them together. So in terms of our usage, uh, we can pass a, a string to a tokenizer. Java's got a built-in tokenizer class, actually does the same thing. Give it the delimiter and then separate it all out so we can see all the first names and all the last names and all the addresses or something to get that information. So pass null for each one of the su successive calls. So here's an example of its usage. Um, in terms of main, we have hello to the world as an array, and we're going to have a tokenizer pointer. It's going to be also be a character. And so this is going to be equal to, and then we're writing this method here, a string toke on this character array, and we're looking for the spaces. So we're going to have hello to the world. Those are going to be our tokens that come out of that. So while it doesn't equal null because there's a null character at the end, so now I can probably see why the null character is so important because we can check to see if or hit the end of the string. Notice that null here, while it's not null, then see out the token and then uh, a, a new line returns. So token is equal to token null. We put the null in here with a space because that's the end. It's not going to print anything. So it will actually print out the last character, but it's empty. So the output is hello to the world on different lines. So it comes out correctly. We can also do this way with an E. So instead of using the space, we just picked randomly an E. And so we can say, um, well, there's an E after the H in hello. <laughs> so H. And then the E's, notice, aren't being printed. So we got hello to the, 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 without the E, world. So it does the same thing as before. The token character, tokenized character, doesn't print. Here it's hard to tell because it's spaces, but uh, the E's not going to print here if we do this. Which is why you get rid of the commas. You don't have to worry about it. The commas go away. You use a comma for it as well. So I recall that we have message 8 from our previous example. So to compiler, the value of the identifier message alone is the base address of the array. So we say the message is a pointer because it's a value as an address. It points to memory. Remember that concept sort of as a, as a this is not the end this is just the end of this part so skip this next slide here but uh, remembering that uh, each one of the spaces is an index value as if it were a message in a character array um, is helpful so. so we can do aggregate string IO in C++ so aggregate string IO is a Take an I.O. of an entire string. It's possible using an array and identifier. No subscripts and no looping, actually. Here's an example where we have character message. We can see in the message. So do we have to, we don't have to go 0, 1, 2, 3. If we were seeing array values in, we'd have to come up with a loop. For I is equal to 0, I, you know, less than 10, I plus plus. And then C in, you know, message I. And then this first character, second character, third character, fourth character. Don't have to do that. You can just take the whole thing. And this is called an aggregate, aggregate string I.O. Because you're taking it as a whole. We can also do the extraction. So you might know that this is an extraction operator. Um, so you use it in terms of the, 
the input that's coming in. So when using the extraction operator, read in the input characters into the string. And then we have the operator that skips over any leading white spaces characters, such as blanks and then the lines. So we'll skip the line returns and blank characters. So it reads the characters in, stops at the first trailing white space character. So if you have two words, you get two strings. Stop, stops at the white space. So you have input one number one, input number two, input number three, all in the same line. So it stops at the first white trailing space, and then it adds a null character at the end of the string. So here's an example usage here with the character name 5, CN5. So the total number of elements in the array are supposed to, uh, suppose we have the input stream that looks like this, Joe. Someone typed in Joe, or J-O-E. So then the null character is added to the end of it here. So we didn't get five characters, we got four characters. Because we got J-O-E, the, the null character. This is a word wrapped, but this... This character, null character, should be in this space right here where this arrow is pointing. So, so that's the CN stops at trailing white characters. The get treated a little bit differently. So you can see in dot get. So you don't have to use the directional, you don't have to use these arrows here. Extraction operators. Extraction operator. This is, what this is called an extraction operator. You can actually use the get with that. If you use the get with that, because the extraction operator stops reading at the first trailing space, uh, you can't put in a string with blanks. So you type in your first and last name. When you typed in the first name, the CN is going to stop right there at the space between the first and last name, and it's only going to take the first name. And you're going to fight with yourself for a while, and you're going to go, "Oh, it's not working! It's not working!" And it'll just change the method. Don't use the extraction operator. Use the get. Gets the entire line. Gets everything in there. So if your string's declared size is not large enough to hold the input screen, it will add the null character. The extraction operator stores the characters in the memory beyond the end of the array. It will actually, it'll actually go past the size of the array. So use the get function with two parameters to overcome this obstacle. So inputs at most seven characters plus the null character. So you get into this message eight characters. If you don't put eight in there, you just leave it. Actually, you can't you have to put something in there. Uh, but what ends up happening is um, you'll write past the size of the array by doing a CN. So someone enters in their first name, but they put in something that's really huge. And your array wasn't designed. That will crash your program, actually. Um, so you limit the number of characters that can uh, be accepted. And if you use a get with the cn dot get is a method just to get into the string this number of characters, it will um, actually take the white spaces too. It will take everything all the way up to that number. So in file stream dot uh, get, so get does not skip leading white spaces characters such as blanks and new lines. So you can get which is going to read a success of characters including blanks into the array stops when either the recount character occurs or it reaches the new line expression, the forward slash n. So forward slash n happens at the end of each one of the lines, whichever one comes first. Get appends the null character to the string as well. So if it's reached, the new line is not consumed by the get, but remains waiting for the input stream. So it will read it line by line and multiple lines. So this is the file stream or the in file stream dot get so we also have the function ignore so we can get rid of the things we don't want like new line characters so you can be used to consume any remaining characters uh, that ends up at the new line so this will here will be ignored left from the input stream from a get so get the string and puts 81 characters ignores the last one excuse me we'll get up to 81 character 80 characters because it goes up to 81 and then ignore, ignores the last one, so stops when it reads that and ignores it. So basically, ignore your new lines, reads it up, ignore that one, read it up. Because you don't want a file read in with all these new line characters if it's multiple lines. Another example of using get, uh, what do we have here? We're just going to put the get character at the end here. So we have a character, we have a full name, and we have an address. So it says enter your full name, we're going to get 31 characters. And then we're going to get character. 
which is the new line or a space actually at that point, and then enter the address and we get another address. So we, instead of using ignore, we just get the next one. We know it's going to be a space. So after 31. So, so here we have uh, nil space uh, Dale, or whatever, Neil Dale or something like that, full name, and then we have the address that comes next. So string function prototypes are in string.h. If you open up string.h, you can actually see them. And if you look at them, you see we have string length, string compare, string copy, and all these different function prototypes that are in there. So here we can do a uh, you know, character author, integer length, get the character author, 21 characters. What's the string length here for the author? It's going to be 21 plus 1 because we're going to have the new character at the end. What's the output here? Well, it's going to print out just this. It doesn't print out the null character. So, so just remember there's a null character at the end of it, and uh, you won't end up with the, the being off by one. So. so let's see if there's anything else in here that is of value. Let's just come more examples here. Uh, we can use type define with arrays as well. Um, so as we mentioned before, that Boolean, integer to Boolean, this is common, where we have type define character, and the character is going to be a string 20, 21. Names tw string 20 is the name of the array type, has subs subscripts 21. So we have 20, string 20 is the first, uh, excuse me, uh, my name, declaring a variable called my name. So we're calling it string 20. So we can take in and we can uh, declare three variables here as an example. My name, your name, is senior citizen. So now we're using a name instead of an array. So it doesn't look like a name. Very similar to what the string class has done. So because I said string is a character array, well, if you think about it, it's sort of like a type define, but there's more methods. It's an object. It's not implemented this way. But you can create your own object uh, or your own user-defined data type that has a more meaningful name, like first name, last name. And so you can go first name, you know, as a variable. And it could be a, a string, a character array of 20 characters or something. So... Uh, so what's this here? An example program that will uh, read in ID numbers, hourly wages, names, and of up to 50 people from a data file, and then display the ID, the names, and all those things. And let's see. If we have a data file, for example, this is so the string um, methods and the string functionality is used a lot with file I/O because we're going to read a file in, we're going to parse it out, we're going to display it on the screen, or we're going to do something with it. So here's an example. Um, is the parallel arrays that I talked about yesterday. So we can have multiple different arrays holding in floats, integers, and doubles, keeping track of each one of them by its index value. And the index value is going to be 0 to 49 because we have 50 people in here. We're going to do a type define uh, for a character. We're going to have the character um, be a, a string 20 with uh, 21 characters. So we declare it with the maximum number of persons using these data types, holds up to 50 strings with 20 characters plus the null character at the end for 21. Because we know that length is 21, so it's 20 characters plus the null character. We get 21 out of it. And then we can uh, see how the parallel arrays work together with the IDs, the wages, and the names that are all stored together by the index values, and the index values are going to be 0 to 49 for all, 40, for all 50 people. And when we use arrays of the strings, we can look at the information that comes through. And uh, we can have a method to get data, a handle request to look up. So we can search through those strings. And the main program is going to have uh, these data types in here. Some method, excuse me, some function prototypes for the get data for the handle request. You can actually cut and paste this code, stick it into a C program, and run it. It actually compiles and works. Uh, but the module structure here is just kind of a way of designing a program using an input file, some functions, because you're going to use a function for it. Otherwise, every time you read a file, then you have to reinvent the wheel. So if you have like five files, just create a function, send the file to the function, have the function read 
parse it all in, tokenize it, put it into an array, maybe put it into some strings for you, some integer arrays or something, and then I use the arrays to print out the data and stuff, and you can pass the array to a function, and you can receive it from the function, and you can do all sorts of things with it using functions, actually. So, I'm not going to go through the rest of this example. If you have an interest in it, you can download it, take a look at it, but... Uh, Ways to improve the efficiency of searching process. Um, you might actually have uh, uh, an understanding that arrays are slow, and they are, which is why we looked at linked lists yesterday, and we're going to look at linked lists again in terms of its implementation with one of the assignments. But um, so arrays are slow. It's a sequential search. So, and array names are sorted sequentially, maybe. You can search one name after another name after another name, and then abort when uh, you find the proper name. Single name is greater than some sort of a, you know, dictionary order, for example. You can apply a better search method for it. So if you have a linear list, uh, which is just going to be an entire, an array is a list, by the way, and it's usually in a line, so it's linear, starting with index values. And you have to start at the beginning of the list, go to the end of the list, which is called a linear search. Very not, not very efficient at all. So you can turn that into a binary search if you can sort it so we have the string that can be sorted, we have the character array that can be sorted. So if the names are sorted, a faster type of search might be uh, a binary search that might be applied to that. So you can use it with an array, um, even though you have this linear structure. The binary can be used instead of the slower sequential, which means uh, arranging the list, which means you have to sort the list first. If you sort the list and it's in alphabetical order, then you can, uh, well, you have to apply a sort algorithm. So it's like really two steps in terms of the data structures being used. Um, you'd have to apply a sort that was efficient. Once you got the sorted array, then you can cut it into and apply a, bi a binary search to it. So a binary search does nothing more than takes the array. I'm not going to go through the sorting or the searching, but take the sorted array that's ordered and uh, look to see, examine, you know, I want to find, that, let's say for the value 10, and I want to find 10 in the, uh, well, let's, let, me, let me pick 8. I'm looking for the value 8, and I have the number of values 0 through 20. So then I split the list in half, and I go 0 through 10, and then I go 11 through 20. And 0 through 9, and 10 through 20. I find the midpoint. And then I find, well, is this number 8? Is it higher than or less than? Is it bigger than 10 or less than 10? If let's say 10 was the midpoint. I say, well, it's less than 10. Then I get rid of, now my search is half, the half space, so I can go from 0 to 10. Now I cut that in half again, and I go, well, is 8, probably the midpoint is going to be 5. It's going to be larger than 5, so it's going to be in the second half. And so I can do that with an array, actually. And if I do that with an array, I've cut down the search space, and I've made it easier. But you have to sort the array. But arrays, in general, are generally sorted, uh, because... A lot of the data that's been put into the array is, is definitely um, carefully uh, assigned, and usually most of the arrays are easily sorted through a loop. So, so I'm not going to go through the binary search, but if you have an interest in that, it's at the end. This is lecture number six, by the way, um, that will go through the concept of the array, or sorting array, searching array. So it's all about everything everyone needed to know about arrays. I'm not going to bore you with all of the details of the binary search. This isn't really an algorithms course, uh, but uh, know that arrays are kind of lend themselves quite well because you have an ordered list for the most part. So, All right, so it's time for our first break, actually, for those of us who came here at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, let me end this video and start in a new subject when we come back from the break. So.